I really enjoyed your recent piece on Shohei Atani's translator, <laughs> and, and really enjoyed the very subtle use of sarcasm within that. Um, <laughs> I, I just cannot believe that we're supposed to, on Major League Baseball's uh, word, go past all these multi-million dollar athletes. Uh, and athletes have a proclivity for really serious gambling and gaming addiction. We can get into this uh, later on in our conversation and blame, you know, the translator. Uh, it just, it, I, it, it's a scandal. It's an ever... A uh, growing scandal because people will not talk about the plague of addiction in our athletes now. Um, and the addiction isn't drinking or smoking or drugs that it was back in my day. Not that I was an athlete like uh, Jimmy or Craig or, or you guys, but um, gambling and gaming is just sweeping over athletes now. It really is a very, very significant problem. And I see it because that's a gateway into match fixing and a gateway into corruption. Do you see, Declan, uh, the, at, at the top end of the game, it happening less uh, because of the money that the players are paid uh, from a match-fixing point of view? And the real problem is the lower divisions that are susceptible to taking a bribe or match-fixing? Um, there's two big motivations uh, for match-fixing. One is not getting paid. And as you know, that's a perennial problem in football. Um you know, your colleagues in the Spanish La Liga, once you drop out of Atletico, Real, Barcelona, like some of those guys, some of those teams don't pay their players for like six, seven months. I mean, a series of strikes in Spanish football where, you know, you get the, you get the Lionel Messi or, you know, Santi Crizola or something standing up and saying, look, we get paid, but the guys that we're playing against every week, you know, they've got wives and kids and they haven't seen, uh, you know, a single Euro for months. So Spain, as you know, has been hit with a number of major uh, match-fixing um, uh, scandals, some of them second and third division, but some of them in La Liga. So that's one issue. But the other issue, which is really this issue that we're talking about with Major League Baseball, is that if you're an addict, it doesn't matter how much you get paid. If you're Gianluigi Buffon, uh, your colleague, you know, one of the great goalkeepers of the world, um, he lost all his money gambling. In fact, not only did he lose all his money gambling and all the salaries and sponsorship, he was millions of euro in debt with illegal bookmakers. Um, Wayne Rooney, uh, not saying that he's become bankrupt, but he was a serious gambling addict for a long time. Uh, Paul Merson obviously is. Um, I could go on and on and on. There's a long, you know, Phil Mickelson, John Daly, Michael Jordan, Pete Rose. He, I, I could literally take half an hour and just recite, you know, the problem is that if you are a top athlete, the very characteristics that make you good as, a, as an athlete, never giving up, single-minded obsession, overturning odds. Everybody says, hey, Jimmy, there's no way that you guys can, can turn over that 2-0 two, two deficit 10 minutes to go. Jimmy's not going to give up. He's going to keep going right to the last second, right to the last moment of perspiration. And that makes you a terrible gambler. Um, as James knows, um, I have a lot of professional gamblers in my roster of contacts, and they are math nerds on steroids. Like, they're utterly dispassionate. They're utterly unemotional. If they have any emotion in any team, they just turn off and they don't bet on those things. It's only to make money, and they're very, very rare. But everything that makes an athlete good makes them a terrible gambler. Terrible gambler. So... The game, the sport of football has now gotten too fast uh, to be able to do drinking and drugs on a regular basis. You know, you occasionally see these guys going off on benders, but, but you just can't, you can't drink as you used to be able to 20 years ago. The game is too fast now. But the same stress is there. The same tens of thousands of people are screaming, you know, you're a bloody idiot when you drop the ball and make a mistake you didn't want to do. So they have to put themselves somewhere. And they're turning to gambling and gaming. Um, you know, gaming is the start and they'll get into gambling. I, I'm not suggesting, Craig, that every single week in the Premier League there's a fixed match. But I am saying that there is a host of players in that league who are addicted. Absolutely addicted. And very, very few people are talking about it. One of the few exceptional people who are talking about it is, of course, Tony Adams. 
the former Arsenal captain, who had serious problems with addiction, woke up one day and just realized, I don't like who I am. And there's nowhere as a professional, high profile professional footballer, I can go to get help because every time I go to a therapist's office, you know, my photos shows up in some tabloid. So he sets up Sporting Chance, which is a fantastic organization. Again, I'm very close with those guys. I won't break any confidences, um, but their work among high level sports people is um, truly shocking, truly shocking. Declan, do you not think as well that it's got a little bit to do with uh, with boredom for a lot of the athletes? Simply because if you think you go into training in the morning, you train for an hour and a half and you're done for the rest of the day. Yeah. And if you don't have a hobby, you're looking to, to find something to do. And I remember a lot of the guys after training, bored, just jumping into the bookies and going to put a few bets on. Um, and I think the other thing is today where you'll probably find a lot more athletes are gambling is simply because of the fact it's so easy now. It's everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere in all it's, sports. It's, it's on your mobile, phone. Computer, correct. Yeah. You know, it's like it's like being an alcoholic and walking around with a bar in your back pocket. Like you can never get away from that that touching and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I do. I, I also don't think that um, we should downplay that in many countries there's a a pretty well-organized system of fixing. Uh, we have one that's so well entrenched here in North America that most of our um, uh, North American sports fans uh, suffer from serious cognitive dissonance. Um, and that's tanking. Tanking is, is just fixing. It's just organized fixing. And don't tell me that if you're a player, a linebacker in the National Football League, and you know you're supposed to lose this game, you're not going to start betting against yourself. I mean, tanking is a massive problem. In football, in Sistema, the system is alive and well in Portugal, Spain, Italy, Greece, Turkey, across much of Eastern Europe. And that's the, that's the situation where late in the season, Jimmy, um, the middle ranking teams, the teams that aren't going to be losing and aren't going to, you know, aren't going to be promoted, just go, oh, saw this and start selling their points to the teams that need it. So that's the club owners come in and say, OK, we're going to lose this. They get the three points. We get two million euro and a chance to bid on their start player next year. So that system is really alive and, and pumping away. Wow. You mentioned gaming there a little bit earlier. Um, esports is, is growing enormously mm. at the moment. Millions of people watch this stuff. I don't get it myself. I'm old. Um, is, is that an opportunity for the bookies, for, for the, the, the fixers? Is that happening in that industry? Or, or oh, gosh, it? yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, in fact, um, so two factoids. And by the way, I want to get to Brazil in a second. Um, Israel and Brazil has have kicked up on... Um, my team's radar screen in the last week or so, because there's tons of fixed matches there. But to get to your question about esports, um, I remember talking to a senior bookmaker for one of the biggest bookmakers in the world. And they reckon year over year, esports now ranks with National Football League in terms of total betting. Now, obviously, National Football League goes, you know, essentially September to you know mid-January, and esports goes January 1st to December 31st. But that under 30 demographic is just crazy about esports. Um, esports is the wild east. Um, there's virtually no regulation in it. Much of it is run out of China. Uh, many of the best players are, are uh, impoverished Russians. And uh, on it goes. Like, on it goes. It's, it's just a major, major match fixing. And the scandal, I think, uh, and I've written about this in the Globe and Mail and have seen nothing about it, is that match fixing is not illegal in Canada. And all the fixers know it. So some of them move to Canada because they're like, what are you going to do? You're not even going to be able to arrest me. So many of the esports fixers come to Canada and set themselves up here. No kidding. Right. Yeah. So why, wow. why is that? I mean, it's illegal elsewhere. Why, uh, why is the Canadian government not... not in that, in uh, that. The um, federal government, for some reason, I don't understand it. Um, you know, I talked to the Ministry of Sports before they legalized sports gambling. I said, okay, that's cool. I'm totally for legal sports gambling. I've seen the other side. 
and I'm for legalized sports gambling. I'm not for hypocrisy. Lots of people like to gamble. I don't, but you know, lots of people do. Um, but change the criminal code of Canada. It's just one paragraph, and you just amend it to say match manipulation for the purposes of betting is fraud. And bingo. Then you've got all these police officers who are coming to me because most police officers love their sport and saying, hey, we're hearing all this stuff, but we can't do anything. We literally cannot do anything. You mentioned earlier that you see a higher incidence of gambling when players are put in substandard conditions. And unfortunately, the nature of the women's game is just that, that the standards are often quite poor, whether they're playing for their national teams and if they're fighting against their federations or um, across the world where you're only now seeing a boom in women's pro soccer. And most most players are, are amateur or are paid unfairly and not paid a living wage. So is there enough data um, on women's football now where you're seeing a proclivity um, for, for gambling because now there is that exponential growth and then maybe there is more money in it? Or is there just not enough research on it yet? Um, I, I don't always believe in the data, just as a general thing, because the data is so skewed off. And I can get into that if you guys feel like going wonky. What I do believe in is talking to the fixers. And I still talk to many fixers. And a number of them have just said, hey, we're going to go fix women's sports because nobody nobody pays any attention to them. And the women are really, as you're saying, Amy, are very badly paid. And I can fix a game there for, you know, 100 euro, for 200 euro. Like, uh, I don't have any problem. They don't hassle me. Women are generally more honest. So when they agree to the fix, they actually go ahead and do it. Um, uh, and nobody's paying any attention. So, um, uh I think it's a huge problem. Uh, and um, the other issue, and I'm hesitating to bring it up as you guys can see and as, I, as our listeners and viewers can, can see in my face, you know, I, I started this morning's conversation with Craig about the plague of gaming and gambling addiction among male athletes. I think the other plague that's going on specifically and particularly in African football uh, but uh, around the world is um, sexual extortion and bribery. Um, there must be an African team, an, excuse me, an African national team that doesn't force their women to have sex with their coach. I just don't know who it is. There must be. There must be some innocent ones. But it is so rampant. Um, and it, it's an issue that I really think should be laid at the feet of Gianni Infantino. Uh, this is baked into the system, and it should, you know, there should be hotlines set up. There should be ways of combating this. And as far as I'm concerned, that kind of abuse trumps um, match fixing any day of the week because that is a, it's a football game. But that where you're ruining the souls of these young women players are is appalling, and it's a really, really, really widespread issue in football. And even as recently as the last Women's World Cup, I think there were accusations levied at the Zambian national team coach, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and it got it got played down with that thing with the Spanish uh, president of the Spanish Football Association forcing the kiss. Fair play, fair play. I, 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 but the amount of attention dedicated to that, whereas you see just this this plethora of cases. A good friend of mine, and a fellow Canadian, fellow Canadian hero like Greg. Is uh, Craig is a guy, uh, Richard McLaren, and he did a major investigation into um, uh, the plight of women in basketball in Africa. And it's shocking. It's absolutely shocking. And again, this is really easy stuff to fix. Um, uh, and I really think FIFA needs to be playing a, a, a major role in this. It's really easy to set up hotlines. It's really easy to send in independent ombudsmen to say, hey, if your coach says the only way you're going to get on the football team or the national team is to do the following. Here's where you go. This is what you do. These are the things that you can do. Declan, you said at the beginning you had Brazil and I think it was Israel that popped up on your radar. Can you explain that? Like, What, what is it that pops up? What is it that you, you notice in those situations? Well, Israel, um, you know, the fixing has been going on for over a year and it's absolutely rampant. And the Israeli Football Association kind of I was quoted uh, by a bunch of Israeli newspapers and then the Israeli Football Association was supposed to reach out and we were, my unit here at the university was going to give them all the information we had. 
and we never got that call. We also got a call from the Brazilian authorities uh, maybe seven, eight months ago because there's major fixing going on in their Premier League, their, their, you know, their big league. And um, uh, I spoke to the senior Brazilian government officials and I said, you think it's a problem because these top teams may be implicated in fixing. That's not your issue in Brazil. The fixing has now become so endemic that you have 15-year-olds fixing their game. You've got reports coming out of Sao Paulo that in these these tournaments, very much like the Robbie on the outskirts of Toronto, yeah. like high school players are fixing their game. That's how endemic it is. Wow. And the reason why I wanted to um, bring it up is that two days ago, the Brazilian Football Association, the CBF, announced that they were doing a 30 million euro sponsorship with a betting company. So we've got this enormous amount of match fixing going on in Brazil from the 15 year olds all the way up to their premier league. Um, and they're just getting deeper and deeper and deeper into a relationship with gambling companies. And they have not figured out what they're doing and they haven't, they haven't uh, really had an adult conversation about what it can mean to their sport. Wow. You've spoken about this unit at the university of New Haven in Connecticut. Can you explain some more about that exactly for, for our listeners and viewers? Yeah, it's um, my strength is talking to people that most people don't talk to. So I go to my way to um, talk, talk to you yourself, obviously, James. <laughs> <laughs> you beat me to it. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, mate. I've got to stop it. All right. that, that's it. That is a free zone. No more jokes because I really no. don't like you. Please, so please don't stop, talk. Declan. Keep going. No, 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 your boots. Particularly as I admire his beard and goatee. I think mean, it's very dashing um, and distinguished. Um, <clears throat> look, my strength at the unit is when I talk to match fixers and professional gamblers and um, bookies, illegal and legal bookies. Um, um, but the guys. I, I, I've enlisted and recruited one of the world's, <clears throat> excuse me, top um, sports bookmakers. Um, so he gave up the um, business a couple of years ago, got into anti-money laundering, and is now working very closely with me. Um, I'll tell you one story just because I think it really illustrates the nature of sports gambling. Um, he was a top bookmaker in Europe. And I asked him, how many customers did you have? And he said, uh, maybe about a million. I'm like, oh, that's that's quite cool. He goes, okay, well, how many of those guys won? Like, you know, won. And he goes, you mean like in a year, like January 1st to December 31st? I was like, yeah, yeah. Like how many of those guys, how many of that one million actually won? And he goes, um, five? And I was like, you mean, you mean 5,000? He goes, no, no, I mean five. I'm like, 500? No, five. And I actually know them, and I'm, I'm, I'm counting their names on my finger. That's how rare it is to win at sports gamble. So it's my message when I talk to my students and anywhere out in the public is ignore the advertisements. The bookmakers spent tens, hundreds of millions of dollars creating this idea that any fan can come out ahead of them. You know, it's all part of your glamorous uh, lifestyle. It's not. It really is not. We, we should I remember uh, Mar Mauricio Tarico, an Argentinian player that came to Ipswich, and I was horrified by the stories he was talking about in Argentina. And you talk about those middle-of-the-road teams that aren't going down, they're not going up, they're sitting there and coming in after a warm-up, and you got a brown paper bag on everybody's uh, stall, and this is what's going to happen. It's going to be a nil-nil match. Like, And I was just like, wow, I mean... And I had never seen anything like that. I never knew and never heard anything like that as a as a young uh, Canadian going over to to England and coming from a country where we're you know it's all sportsmanship and fairness and competition and all this. It was like it's uh, it was quite horrifying. So it's not something new, but it's also uh, something I guess that uh, is expanding and becoming more of an issue all the time. 